It's the earliest epoch of the late Triassic, and relaxing in South America is a Herrerasaurus. She's happily digesting her latest kill when she feels something lightly tap her on the snout. Looking up, she sees it's beginning to rain. No worries, she thinks. I'm sure it won't last long. The Triassic was an important time for most of life on Earth. It marks the start of the age of reptiles, as well as two groups that would dominate the land across various periods to come, dinosaurs and mammals. Now I've spoken before about how weird things got in terms of fauna, which I highly recommend that you check out. But in short, things got really experimental owing to all these new open niches that were left behind from the Permian mass extinction. Pushing this experimentation further, was an event of major global consequences known as the Carnian Pluvial Event. This is the time that you're going to hear more commonly referred to by the title of this video because it really did rain for two million years. Planet Earth during this time was extraordinarily different to today with all of the global land masses being conjoined into the single supercontinent Pangaea. And when this happens any water in the air can only go so far inland before it dissipates and falls down, meaning that the only lush green environments were around Pangaea's perimeter, and the majority of land on Earth was very dry and arid. Despite how much terrestrial vertebrates varied in terms of strangeness and size, the one thing they had in common was the fact that they were all fairly low animals, owing to the fact that plant life couldn't really grow tall, and the predators didn't need to be particularly tall to prey on those low browsing herbivores. But around 234 million years ago, we see the temperature increase even more globally, and with that an increase in the amount of estuary, lake estuarine, and flood deposits across the entire continent, not just the outskirts. Now these deposits appear to have been laid down across roughly 2 million years, and the only thing that can cause such a widespread increase in aquatic deposits is one serious rainy spell. It's estimated that average global annual rainfall was around the same as today's most humid rainforests, which is a lot. Potentially up to nearly 400 inches of rain each year. Now, of course, this doesn't necessarily mean that there was a constant downpour 24 seven, no matter where you went, but it does mean that the driest spell you could hope for would still bring the odd drop out of the sky. Now, even for a British person, two million years of rainfall is noteworthy. So what caused this? Well, remember that the global temperatures increased? Well, this increase in temperature will mean that water from the ocean will evaporate into the atmosphere at a much higher rate. Since there's more moisture in the air from the oceans, it can permeate further into the land and fall as rain year round, meaning that all of Pangaea was getting a healthy dose of ocean moisture. As to exactly why these temperatures increased, geologists have been arguing about this for a while, but there is one leading theory that has been settled on. This theory is that, much like the Permian mass extinction, it was all thanks to volcanism. Now, unlike the PT mass extinction, the volcanism was on a much smaller scale, specifically the buildup of the Rangelia flood basalts in the most northern parts of North America. This event put out enough lava to cover the entirety of the coast of Alaska and Canada, creating lava that was six kilometers thick in some places and injecting enough CO2 within a short space of time to increase the temperature of the world. Again, this wasn't quite to the extent of the PT Siberian traps, or even the increase seen today, but it was enough to push temperatures up enough that a huge load of ocean water evaporated and precipitated across this vast amount of time and space. What likely didn't also help was the uplift of the Sumerian orogeny. This was a mountain building event that is thought to have created a strong differential between the north and south, creating further monsoons across the heart of the land. There is one more potential aspect that may have exacerbated things, which is the orbital parts of the Milankovitch cycles. Now, if you would like for me to explore these Milankovitch cycles in further detail, please let me know down below. So how do you tell that it once rained on a rock billions of years ago? Well, on a small enough scale, you can't, but on a big enough scale, we do see quite a few things. We see flood deposits for a start across the entire globe which show a close enough proximity to either river or lake deposits. 
which wouldn't have overflowed this often without a very regular input of rain. On top of this, we also see a short-term excursion of oxygen isotopes, in which the temperature is hot enough that the heavier isotopes of oxygen are lifted and deposited into the poles where things can finally be cold enough for them to sink back down. Okay, so what? It rained for a while. Who cares? Well, it's a slight misconception that the next faunal turnover took place solely due to the PT mass extinction. And whilst that is true to some extent, it doesn't quite paint the whole picture. In actuality, it is this pluvial event that served as the final push for the new kids on the block to take over. Now remember what I said about most terrestrial animals being very low to the ground? Well, those guys were about to get a very nasty shock. Given the much higher rainfall, the organisms to see the immediate benefits were obviously the plants. Rather than sticking low to the ground to absorb what little moisture they could find, they could now grow back up to the tall and lush level that they hit during the Carboniferous. As the flora grew in both height and abundance, the fauna began a changeover as a direct response to this. Since the plants could now grow tall and woody to avoid those pesky low browsers, animals such as Lystrosaurus that had dominated for so long were now seeing their food source dwindle, especially since these taller plants blocked out the sunlight for the lower plants. Instead, a new group, which we would later name dinosaurs, utilised their features of pillar-like legs to grow much taller, meaning that no one else was competing for the new food source. Now I am going to do a video on sauropod importance soon enough, but it would appear that it is these guys that pushed other dinosaurs to grow both in size and diversity. So rain isn't just something that ruins barbecues for us Brits, turns out it also gave us the most iconic group of prehistoric creatures. Now whilst your mind is being blown by that, I'm going to answer today's questions, the first of which comes from Josh the Mighty 9967 who's asked, My question was, do you think larger sized sauropods within the Morrison formation of the late Jurassic period of North America were aggressive towards predators? This would primarily concern Diplodocus, Apatosaurus, Brontosaurus, Camarasaurus and Brachiosaurus. Also, this sauropod aggression would be extended to Argentinosaurus and Patagotitan, which I know weren't from the Jurassic, but I was curious about the topic. If I may squeeze this last part into my question, sorry. Naughty, naughty. Um, do you think the Jurassic species of sauropods I named above might have fought one another over food or territory if times were tough? If so, how can you see that going? Um, okay, I have answered the latter part of that question previously. Um, I can't remember which one, but I'll find it and I'll leave a link to that here. Um, but I don't think I touched on theropods, so we'll do that part of the question now. Not gonna lie, you sound like someone who is just begging for a remake of Jurassic Fight Club. Except, you know, good. The Morrison Formation is pretty famous for its sauropod turnover. But the Predator Guild is one that hasn't seen as much change of the guard. So how aggressive sauropods were really just depends on which one we're talking about and what were the capabilities of the largest theropods from here, namely Allosaurus and Ceratosaurus. If Allosaurus used group efforts for hunting or even partook in flesh grazing from sauropods as has been theorised, then even the largest sauropods would be wary of these guys, so absolutely would display aggressive behaviour towards them if seen. This would have been purely for self-preservation rather than protecting their young, however, since we know that sauropods were in no way caregiving parents. Camarasaurus especially would likely have been pretty hostile towards these guys as the smallest of the list when fully grown. But I do think that the bigger they got, the less heed they would have paid, since the predators likely didn't try their luck all that often on fully grown and healthy adults. This is probably even more the case when it comes to Argentinosaurus and Patagotitan, since their main defence strategy is intimidation through sheer size, which wouldn't have come into play until they were fully grown. Before that, sauropods didn't really have anything as juveniles to be threatening with, so avoidance rather than aggression would have been the best policy. Look, I know what we can all get like with a shoe when we see a spider in the house, but most other animals are really not that bothered by animals that are so much smaller than them, especially when they don't really have any young that they care enough about to protect. Uh, our next question comes from R400 SA1 SAI. I'm going to have to change the font so I can tell the difference. Um, anyway, um, who has asked? I'd like to hear more about Holocene megafauna. 
Why isn't almost any of it left apart from the African continent and some examples in Asia? I know it was due to human hunting and habitat loss, but how did this all happen so quickly? I know about species like the stellar sea cow on the mower, but if you look up some animals, you realise that there were lots and lots more, and now we barely see any big wild fauna. So how did the ecosystem adapt to the disappearance of these animals? Hmm. Okay, so again, I've kind of answered this question already, with the biggest effects being our dispersal, colonisation, and ultimately the urbanisation of most of the world. Given this, the ecosystems didn't really have a huge amount of space to actually change thanks to the disappearance of these animals. Africa and much of Asia are the ancestral homes for most of today's megafauna, and these happen to be the two continents that have seen the lowest percentage of urbanisation, hence the lowest extinction rate for the Holocene. But they're still seeing the effects, and still the last bits left. Even then, you could argue that with the context of deep geological time, there's not really anything special about these continents. We're just simply seeing a very small snapshot before they ultimately perish as well. Two main causes of this is anthropological influence, like you said, and climate change, and not just the kind that was caused by us. The last glacial maximum of the current ice age ended around 11,700 years ago, which just so happens to be when the shits really hit the fan for much of the megafauna. Some argue over it being one versus the other, but the likeliest explanation over why it happened so quickly is that this natural climate change warmed up the planet and put the megafauna in a vulnerable position anyway, before we rocked up, spread around the globe, overhunted and ultimately heated up the planet at an exponential rate, rather than letting the interglacial period run its course. Anyway, thank you so much for submitting those questions, uh, I hope you enjoyed the answers, and if you have a question that you would like me to answer in any future videos, be sure to head over to my community tab, where you'll find a post where I'm collecting all of the questions. Um, Please don't post them down in the video comments, otherwise I just lose track of them. Having said that, still comment down below as to what you thought about this video, and if you really enjoyed it, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, so that I can catch you guys next time.